Hello and welcome to week nine of Psychology 101. Today we're going to be talking about consciousness, which is one of my favorite subjects. One, because it's purely philosophy and we don't know a whole lot about it, honestly. When I think about consciousness, first I like to think about the difference between the consciousness and the unconscious, right? So your conscious is always aware. That is the aware part of you, the part of you that is focused, the part of you that is paying attention, that is your conscious mind. And your unconscious is doing everything else. And so one of my favorite questions about consciousness is, what is actually driving you? Is it your unconscious driving you or is it your consciousness? Because your body, for example, has all of these processes going on and your body is then talking to your brain and your body is telling you things like, I am hungry, go find food. I want sex, go find someone to mate with. You have all these biological processes driving your brain and also driving your action. So how much of you is you and how much of you is your genetics, you know, your biology that is driving you, that human side, your humanity, for example. So a lot of the big questions are, how much of you is your unconscious and how much of you is your consciousness? <laughs> so that's the big question, okay? Now, your unconscious is very powerful. It is constantly sig sending signals to your brain, okay? It is constantly driving you, and so that's something you want to be thinking about all the time. The unconscious is also such a powerful thing that it can put you to sleep. When you're awake, you have these alpha waves going through your brain, but then all of a sudden your brain drops some delta waves and puts you to sleep. How does that happen? How does your unconscious have enough power to just turn your consciousness off? Why aren't we conscious all the time, for example? You know, why is it that our unconsciousness is driving us? Think about it when you're walking down the street. Somehow you're able to walk and do a bunch of stuff while you're focusing on like a street sign or whatever you're reading or something like that. It's your unconsciousness that's walking you. So how does your unconscious know to walk? <laughs> your consciousness isn't telling it to walk, okay? Who is driving you? So what is consciousness? I always just think of it as awareness, okay? And the unconscious, everything else. What do we know about consciousness? We know about some brain activity, and that's about all we really understand, okay? All right, so we're gonna be studying consciousness. How do we measure consciousness? Again, what's a definition of consciousness? The easiest thing I can say is to be aware, okay? That's it, it's just awareness of stimulus. Your awareness that you are sensing things, that you were thinking, that you were cognitive. That's how I think about consciousness, okay? Again, it's very hard to study. The best thing we have to study is brain activity. So again, we stimulate you and then we see what happens. <laughs> That's how we're studying consciousness because it's very hard. It's like the bottom of the ocean. It's not something we totally understand yet, okay? So again, when we're looking at consciousness and we're studying intention, we're trying to, all we can really focus on right now is brain activity. So that's the main thing we're focusing on, okay? So unconscious processing, again, we are constantly being bombarded with stimuli. Like you are aware of the air, you are aware of the wind, you are aware of all these sounds going on all the time, but your consciousness is only able to really think about one thing at a time, okay? So your unconsciousness is the one that is experiencing all this suppressed stimuli, this information that is below your threshold of awareness, below your threshold of consciousness, okay? So your unconscious is, you know, dealing with your heartbeat and dealing with the environmental factors and examining whether you're hot or cold, and then, then it is sending that information to your consciousness, okay? So you have all these neural pathways that go from your oldest part of your brain and uh, to the limbic system, the middle part of your brain, to the cortex, to the outer part of the brain where the consciousness most likely probably exists, okay? These more evolutionary adaptation layers on the outer part of our skull, you know, this is where you see the most activity for memory and things along those lines is in our consciousness, okay? So again, this idea that the unconscious is talking to the conscious is a constant process going on. For example, how much do you find yourself self-talking? Like you did so good on a test and all of a sudden you're telling yourself, wow, you're so smart, you do such a good job on this test, right? And you're like, brain, why are you talking to me? Why are you telling me I just did a good job on the test? I know I did a good job on the test, but that's the idea of self-talk. You know, we all talk to ourselves. Well, who exactly are we talking to? 
And for that, you can look at Freud with the id ego and the super ego. Your inner self is then communicating with your ego, which is moderating between your super ego, your social self, and your inner self, for example. So again, very complex processes going on, okay? So consciousness, again, your consciousness is just, if you're attentive to something or you're not, the consciousness can only focus on one thing. It is your unconscious that is focusing on all these different processes going on, for example, okay? Um, so the consciousness, again, is a construction. Consciousness comes from awareness, but awareness in reality and meaning attached to reality and how information is categorized, again, is socially constructed through conscious interaction with other people, for example, okay? So... Can we use brain measurements to infer consciousness? So again, to look at whether somebody is conscious, aware or not, you can look at the conditions like brain death, coma, vegetative state, slightly conscious state. And this is all relative to how much brain activity is actually going on, how much neural transmission is actually going on, okay? So your memories, your knowledge, your unconscious, your consciousness, again, it's just a series of neurons firing and exchanging neurotransmitters to communicate with other neurons to make sense of reality, so to speak, to make sense of the stimuli, to be able to retrieve information, for example. Again, so it's, we're looking at consciousness. One way to define it is like this amount of brain activity that's going on, okay? Uh, consciousness and action. Again, you think most of the time that what you're doing is conscious, but a lot of what your movement is is unconscious, okay? A lot of decisions are going on without you even knowing it. Your unconscious executive functioning is doing a lot for you without your consciousness actually having to be aware, for example. And there's a really good question of like, how long are you quant conscious, for example? So uh, think about like when you're driving a car, are you always aware of everything you're doing at every single moment while you're driving the car? Or is some of you being, is some of, is your unconscious actually driving the car? You know, and so this will kind of freak you out. You ever like go on a road trip and realize that you haven't paid attention to the road in an hour? And you're like, oh my God, I haven't paid attention to the road in an hour. What have I been doing this whole time? Again, it's because your unconsciousness has been driving a car. This is why it's so dangerous to be texting and driving, for example. You're 23 times more likely to get into a car accident if you're texting because the part of your brain that is driving the unconscious and the consciousness, you know, working together to drive that car. The second you start looking at a cell phone, all of a sudden the brain activity, the consciousness, the awareness, and the unconscious process being devoted to driving is now being focused on your phone. Okay, so simply talking in the car on your cell phone is the equivalent of drunk driving regarding the amount of brain activity you have toward driving, okay? So again, what is the purpose of consciousness? Is it, it has to be some kind of an evolutionary adaptation, right? Is it just a random fluke of nature or did it come about through natural selection because those with consciousness, those with the ability to reflect, to think, to anticipate, to know what's coming, are able to survive in the environment better than others, okay? Sleep and dreams is actually fascinating. We totally don't know a whole lot about this either, but at some point your brain is able to turn yourself off. You know, how does this actually work? And again, we look at the brainwave patterns to understand, but then what's the evolutionary adaptation to sleep? Well, sleep has a lot of things, which one of it is because when you turn off your consciousness, that's when your brain is encoding all your memories into information. So when you're a baby, babies sleep a lot, for example, because they get hit with a bunch of stimulus, then they go to sleep for 16 or 18 hours, and then they that's when they're categorizing all their memories, organizing all the information, putting together a construction of consciousness, a conscious awareness of your environment, okay? A lot of this happens when you're sleeping, okay? So we all have this natural circadian rhythm built in. Uh, again, how much are we connected to the moon and the tides and the stars, for example? You know, so all living things have this natural sense of the circadian rhythm. Um, so it, it involves all your biological processes, more than just sleeping and waking. Again, hunger, uh, urine production, blood pressure, alertness, body temperature, mood, sexuality. Um, all of this is built into our biology. And then all of this is built into our unconscious drives. You know, a consciousness is more like a later evolution. All of us had that unconscious drive, just that biological drive, that animal side to us. But as our cortex has developed over millennia, and, you know, we've created these social societies and used language to work together and built this idea of civilization and constructed a reality, which we then 
reproduce from generation to generation by teaching and socializing children and building their knowledge beyond what they would figure out naturally in the environment. You see this development of these cortexes, okay? So, but we're all based on this circadian rhythm. The biology of us is all a big part of who we are. So the book talks about the difference between morning and evening people. Again, it just depends on how you feel. Age tends to affect the times of day you wake up. Teenagers do like to wake up a little bit later, for example. They find they do better in school when you start a teenager later, for example, because that's the body's natural reaction when you're a teenager, okay? Um, jet lag is another thing. So again, when you start to mess up your circadian rhythm, not get enough sleep, for example, uh, it starts to affect you. And we get into a little bit with sleep disorders here in a second, okay? Um, so the brain, again, has these built-in mechanisms for circadian rhythm. The brain is very aware of the 24-hour cycle. It is very aware of the moon spinning. It is aware of when do we need to sleep, you know, and is sleep more of an evolutionary adaptation because when it's dark outside at night, humans can't need to, shouldn't be walking around. If we're living in the mountains, it's probably a good idea to be sleeping so we don't walk off a cliff, for example. Uh, so again, why do we sleep? It's just an overall, it's like evolutionary adaptation. Sleeping is something that has evolved over time. And you have to ask, why is that linger? What does it do for us? What's the purpose of sleep? And a lot of it is just so you can encode memories, just to put everything together. It has to do with rest. It has to do with the brain being able to shut off certain systems. It has to do with reorganization of the brain. It's just an entirely complex process that we don't fully understand yet. Uh, but again, we do know the stages of sleep where the delta waves moves in and then we our, it paralyzes our body a little bit, and then we enter the REM sleep with the rapid eye movement that's characterized by a deep sleep, deep relaxation. The muscles are paralyzed, you know. Dreams are most, like, most intense, arguably, during REM sleep, but again, you dream during the whole cycle of sleep. So as the book talks about, you can wake up a person during different parts of sleep and ask them if they're dreaming. They'll say yes. Uh, more times in REM sleep, but they still find that they're dreaming in other sleep cycles, okay? Um, and so this is a study of the brain waves here to really talk about what happens when you're awake versus when you're asleep, and you can see the disparities, and your book goes into that. Uh, so your sleep disorders, insomnia, not getting enough sleep, uh, sleep apnea, when you stop breathing when you're asleep, narcolepsy, when you're awake and it puts you to sleep, for example, um, Sleep talking, sleep walking, lucid dreaming, um, you know, a lot of sleep studies. So if you guys are into sleep disorders, that's always a good thing to write like a paper on or something like that. Okay. Uh, the study of dreams is very interesting. Okay. Well, again, there's just a lot of theories. We don't totally know why we dream, but, you know, Freud talks about how, you know, the manifest content, the latent content, the overarching themes, and then the subliminal themes. And, you know, is there really something to that or are dreams just totally random or is that your brain just organizing information to a story so that it can encode that information? Uh, there are several theories of dreams. And again, if you guys like dreams, that's also something to write a paper on. Turns out that psychology students love talking about dreams. Um, so whenever you have class discussions, we find you end up talking about dreams most of the whole time. There's a discussion in the book about whether blind people have dreams. And again, this is based upon whether they can see uh, different type they've seen in their life. This depends on different damages in their brain. Uh, this depends on why they're blind in the first place. Uh, again, there's Freud's theory of dreams. And again, the modern theories of dreaming, activation synthesis, synthesis theory, uh, that dreams occur randomly, uh, for example. Um, and then the final part of the book is the idea of hypnosis, the idea of being able to crack into the unconscious to put your consciousness to sleep and make you susceptible, for example. Uh, again, this just increases your suggestibility. Uh, this is, you know, a lot of tooth uh, hypnosis, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I used to go to the comedy shows with a hypnosis just to watch, because <laughs> watching hypnosis comedy is, if you've never seen anything like that before, it's really unique because you know if you can see where some people are open to the suggestions and you have to be open to suggestions to be able to be hypnotized you can totally see the effects of this okay and the idea of hypnosis is just the idea that all of us are suggestible that all of our you know unconscious and conscious thoughts can be influenced in certain ways okay and they kind of wonder if hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness is it something like being put to sleep for example 
Um, and there's just a lot of great debate on hypnosis. Uh, there's other states of consciousness. Can you go beyond consciousness, for example? Can you step outside of your body? Can you have an objective experience? Is that truly even possible? Or is all experience objective? And you're limited by your conscious and your unconscious process, this dual process mind, okay? Um, so meditation, again, is inducing calm, relaxed state through special techniques. Deja vu is a feeling like you've had this before. And again, that, you know, there's many arguments of deja vu that, you know, whenever you say, I just had deja vu, or you ask, what's the definition of deja vu? And really, it's just that, you know, you're thinking about something right before you think about it. So it's still in your working memory, so it feels fresh, and you think it's something you've experienced before, but you did, you just did. It just happened. Uh, so there's a lot to deja vu and things along those lines. Uh, but I hope you guys like this chapter. Um, I think just the most important thing is the idea of the difference in consciousness and unconsciousness. This idea that our brain is a dual track mind, it's a two track mind. You have your unconscious processes and your conscious processes. And, you know, it's debatable that when your body is putting yourself to sleep, is your consciousness totally, you know, totally put to sleep also is that a real good question because even when you're unconscious you're still aware of the environment you still know what's happening around you which is why you can be woken up from your sleep for example so even if you are asleep your unconscious is still aware of the environment and your unconscious can then signal your consciousness to start thinking about it okay and maybe that's the biological reason for consciousness is that it's a way of your unconsciousness to signal some entity, your consciousness to focus on something in the environment, for example. And that's why we are conscious. And so when we're asleep and we need to be woken up, our unconsciousness wakes up our consciousness and tells it to focus on it. So there's a lot of good stuff to think about there. Hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. Please email with any questions.